order. Could we have a roll call, please? Councilman Woodford. Present. Councilman Henry. Here. Mayor Shelton. Here. Vice Mayor Epps. Here. Councilman Walma. Here. All present. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite those that wish to do so to stand for the invocation given tonight by our neighbor, Scott McKinney, pastor of Cookville First Baptist Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States flag. Thank you, Mayor. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for an amazing place to live and for the life that you've given us. God, I thank you for those that serve this community and uh, whether they're uh, by defending us through uh, police and or whether they're helping us, Lord, through um, uh, EMTs or, Father, whether it's uh, helping us, Lord, through uh, fire and anything that could be tragic in our life. God, there's so many people in this community that help us, that serve us, and we thank you for those that serve and protect. We thank you for the direction you've given our, our council, Lord, for uh, helping us through this uh, the, the environment that we have in this world that is unshaky, and, and Lord, we have a, a very solid community, and I thank you for that. Lord, I pray for guidance and direction for our community and for the community leaders. God, thank you for the privilege to live here and to serve here. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, item three, consider approval of agenda as presented. Are there cha changes or corrections? Mayor, we have no changes to the agenda. All right, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. Under Old Business 5A, consider approval of minutes of council meeting held on February 15th, 2018. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion a second. Any discussion? All vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. Thank you, 5B. Consider on second and final reading ordinance 0180101, amending the Cookville Municipal Code, Title 14, Chapter 5, pertaining to stormwater management guidelines for federal and state agencies. Greg Brown. Mayor and Council, this ordinance would uh, require state and federal agencies to get their stormwater construction permits from TDEC instead of the City of Cookville. Uh, we've not had any calls or comments since the first reading. Request your approval. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All vote. Five yes votes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Five C. Consider on second and final reading ordinance 0180203, amending the Cookville Municipal Code. Title 11, Chapter 2, Section 11-202, Anti-Noise Regulations. Mike Davidson. Mayor and Council members, I uh, have not had any. I've had one uh, call and meeting with a local business regarding this particular ordinance. Met with that uh, business earlier this week. Uh, explained the ordinance to them. And I, other than that, I have had no other conversations or calls from anyone regarding the ordinance. And I would recommend approval. Thank you. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion a second. Any discussion? All vote. Five yes votes. Motion carries. Thank you. Under the consent agenda, 6A, consider awarding bids for transformers and 69 KV circuit breakers for the electorate department. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion a second. Any discussion? All vote. Five yes votes. <coughs> motion carries. Under new business, 7A, hold a public hearing and consider on first reading ordinance 0180202, rezoning 540 Neal Street, tax map 66k a portion of parcel 17 from cr regional commercial to cg general commercial mr mills mayor and council members this is the general location and a more specific location of this pro property that's being proposed for rezoning the request was initiated by the property owners uh, miss carolyn pila, pila and glenda newsom um, the track consists of about 20 acres <laughs> as you can see on this map that it's contiguous with cg zoning the requested zone on three sides on the property fronts the bowling world to the west and i-40 to the south there is already a portion of this track right in here that's already zoned the requested cg here's an aerial view of the site and this is a another map of the zoning that surrounds the area this property if you remember council was rezoned from uh, cr to cg uh, a month or so ago and is now effective um, this would basically <coughs> leave this track as an island. Um, and it, they're requesting the rezoning for basically the same reasons that this property requested, and it's due to top topographic uh, reasons and other natural factors which make it less suitable for uh, regional commercial and more <coughs> potential for development as CG. Um, the rezoning was approved by the Planning Commission as recommended by the Planning Department. Thank you. At this time, we'll open the public hearing portion of the meeting. Would anyone like to speak to this matter? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. 
Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All vote. Five yes votes. Motion carried. Thank you. Seven uh, B. Consider resolution R one eight zero three zero four requesting that the Putnam County representatives to the Tennessee General Assembly oppose any proposed legislation that would remove the authority of local governing bodies to regulate short-term rental properties. Mike Davidson. Mayor and Council members, as you know, the Cookville Planning Department spent uh, much of 2017 reviewing, evaluating, studying uh, short-term rentals and those those issues that many cities are, uh, across the state are facing. And throughout the uh, process, uh, an ordinance was adopt or uh, uh, presented to you for consideration. And after several public hearings and receiving public comments, uh, Council adopted the ordinance in December of 2017 that allows for the operation uh, and regulation of short-term rentals. Uh, there is, and we knew at the time that the state, uh, the General Assembly could possibly look to uh, enact legislation that would preempt anything local governments might be proposing or have proposed. And there is a Senate bill at the state right now, Senate Bill 1086, that would uh, preempt and remove the uh, local government's ability to regulate uh, short-term rentals. And this resolution simply asks that our representatives to the Tennessee State, uh, Tennessee General Assembly allow local governments to, uh, to make those decisions. Don't take that control and authority away from local governments and the city council. And uh, I'd be happy to answer, answer any questions, but I'd ask you to, to, uh, to support and approve this resolution. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Um, right now as I understand it the TML lobbyists think that there's uh, it's it's not probably not going to pass under its present form uh, that that's the information we've received <coughs> is that there there's some amendments proposed as well but right now it has been deferred it was to be heard on the 27th February 27th that was deferred by the Commerce and Labor Committee in the Senate to March the 6th so there's still potential that something could be and this passed. just lets Chairman Williams and Senator Bailey know that we would like to retain our authority to regulate uh, short-term rentals yes sir yes. Councilman Henry yes thank you mayor very briefly it just it's just my view my philosophy that the closer you can keep government at home the better off you are and the best bang for the buck <laughs> I think comes from from local government I'm happy to support this uh, because I think uh, like most communities, we know what what works best uh, in our community, and so I'm happy to support this item. Anybody? Yes, sir. Councilman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the, it was brought up. Mike brought this up, and I, I'm glad that we're putting on this. We're putting this on record that we were preferring that we could handle this locally. Uh, the planning department, the planning commission, and the city council had numerous open meetings and discussion among ourselves and the, the public both residents and developers. And I think we came up with a fair consensus ruling on trying to regulate uh, short-term rentals at Airbnb. And I, each city is different. You know, to put us in with a Nashville, Knoxville, or Chattanooga, or Memphis, uh, I don't think it's fair. And to follow Councilman uh, uh, Henry over here, I think it's best <coughs> that local people take care of their own situation and they know their citizens and they know their community and they are more responsive to their local citizens than somebody from Nashville writing something that goes statewide. So I, I appreciate this opportunity to be able to vote on something like this to let our representatives that represent this community in Nashville know how strongly we feel on this. Thank you. Vice Mayor Yes. Yeah, and thank you, Mayor Shelton. Uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate some of my wise the wisdom that uh, my other council members have put forward. I mean, uh, you know, we get mandates. We get mandates all the time from um, from the federal government and from the state and from the state. And um, I agree, Councilman uh, Henry, that uh, it, it, some of the some of the local regu local regulation is probably the, is probably best, and many times is the best. Uh, there's been hours and hours and hours of the Planning Commission and this, this council has done working on this. There's no lobbyists involved in this issue. There's no dollars involved with this issue. Uh, there's, no, there's none of us sitting around trying to compare ourselves to Chattanooga, uh, Nashville, or Knoxville, okay, where a lot of, the, a lot of these is, this is trying to be solved. This is about us, okay, and so I, I'm going to support this resolution wholeheartedly. 
everything that's been set up here, I agree completely. Uh, government at the local level is, is best, and uh, I'm glad we're um, going to share that with them. Seems oftentimes um, things are, uh, are handled there that uh, are sent back to us that sometimes um, maybe um, is best uh, not to be. So um, I wish, um, I hope, hopefully this will not uh, proceed any further, and, and TML keeps us apprised of this. and. Uh, Air folks spent many, many hours on this, and um, I think we had a good resolution and solution of, of which I know the initial bill that was looked at actually included much of what we had done. So uh, thanks to our departments for taking care of that. So any other comments? All right, all vote. Five mm -hmm. yes votes, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, 7C, consider approval of software purchase for customer service utility billing, including ancillary services, bill printing, mobile app, payment processing, and auto queue IVR. Uh, Ms. Emil. Um, Mayor and council members, this evening I am requesting your approval to purchase a new utility billing system along with the added ancillary services. Um, we have been with our current system since 2003 and technology has changed a lot since then. Um, the system is not very user friendly and difficult to extract data from. Um, we've also had difficulties with the system keeping up with the TVA required changes. Um, that prompted us to start looking at other systems about two years ago. We had a committee of representatives from all the utility departments and customer service that assisted in this process. And based on the committee's recommendations tonight, I am recommending to you, to you that we purchase a new system from Southeastern Data Cooperative Inc., also known as SEDC. They are based in Atlanta, Georgia, and currently have 38 TVA distributors as customers and are multi-utility capable. And... Let me go through the cost here. The base utility system, one time upfront cost um, for the infrastructure totals is $67,130. Um, SEDC conversion cost, and um, they will convert all the history that we can extract from our current system, um, is a not to exceed a $10,000. And their estimation for travel and training is $22,485. Um, they will do a planning discovery visit, um, then they will do training before we go live, and when we go live on the system, they will be here right beside us in our customer service department for at least two weeks as we get up and going and used to the system. Then they'll come back probably at our first month end and help us through our first month end. So, um, so $99,615 is the one-time upfront cost for the base system. Um, and then with any other, with any software, you're going to have um, monthly costs, reoccurring costs as you go forward. The ongoing monthly cost, and we will not pay any of these monthly costs until after we go live. Um, the infrastructure um, software um, is third-party software, so I've got that at an estimated $597.50. That's third parties from SEDC, so that's subject to change. Um, the SEDC base solution support is $800 per month. Um, their tech support for infrastructure is $360 a month. Um, they're going to charge us $0.15 cents per bill per month as our base amount. Um, and using January's numbers, that's estimated to be about $3,300 a month. And then that'll fluctuate and go up depending on, you know, as we grow and we get more customers. Um, integration is one penny per month. Um, customer portal is included in the base software and then financial services for um, payment processing is $300 a month. So the estimated monthly cost after we go live is about $5,257. Um, and as I pointed out to you on Monday, we're currently paying with our current system an average of about $2,500 a month, so that is a significant increase. Now the added on services to the system um, with SEDC, um, we're going to allow them to do bill printing. And let me say this first, because we did have some phone calls from some customers since our meeting on Monday that were concerned that we were no longer going to print bills and get a paper bill in the mail. They thought we were going to mm -hmm. mandate that everybody go paperless, and that's not the case. We're still going to print bills and mail bills to those customers that want them. The paperless option is just that, an option for those customers that choose. So the bill printing is going to be a one-time cost of $500 to set up her bill, and then each month it's $2,700 for the first 20,000 bills, and then 11 and a half cents for any bills over that. Late notice is 12 and a half cents, and additional page is 10 cents, and if they stuff any inserts that request will be a penny. And those prices 
individual prices are per contract. I have an asterisk there beside that. That is a fixed amount per the contract and that will not change. Um, and then of course you'll have on top of your bill printing you'll have postage and that'll be the same no matter what system you use. Um, we're also going to contract with SEDC to do payment processing with credit cards. They will charge the customer a convenience fee of 2.45 percent. SEDC will keep that as part of the cost of providing the platform and paying the credit card fees through them. Um, we will not get that money. The cards will be accepted through the customer portal, mobile app, and the phone IVR. And then the additional add-ons, um, we're looking at their mobile app, mobile device app. This will be branded with the city logo, logo and have all the functionality of a customer portal. That'll be $1,500 one-time setup and then $100 a month to maintain. And then the AutoQ IVR system um, is not to exceed a one-time setup of $15,000. And then the monthly amount of that will be based on the usage. Um, 10 cents a minute down to 5 cents a minute depending on volume. Um, they also offer a portal online forms. Um, set up, one time setup on that is $1,500, um, $1,500 one time, and then monthly support of that is $135. So you add up the one time cost for all of that, it's $117,615. Um, we have currently budgeted $170,000 for this project, so we're well within budget. But as I mentioned to you on Monday, there is some additional costs that are unknown. We have to either use our current provider or current software provider or third-party contract to extract the data out of our current system to be imported into the new system. Um, I still think that will keep us well within budget, but if that contract ends up being over $10,000, I will bring that to you to your, for your approval. Now having said all that, what is the benefit for our customers? They will have a very user-friendly customer service portal available to them. Um, well, they'll have access to their account online. They can make changes to their account profile, pay their bills online, view and print PDFs of their bills, um, view payment and usage history, um, sign up for alerts and reminders such as due dates and past due reminders, and they can select email notifications on their bill, go paperless if they choose, and the portal is completely customizable by the city. Um, they were also, the mobile app will be available to them. That basically pushes the functionality of the portal um, to their smartphones and tablets. The app will be free to download and install, and it's branded with the city logo. And the AutoQ IVR system is available to make payments by phone, and we're also going to um, add the Spanish translation, make it available to those customers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a budgeted item and it will be paid for by the utility departments. The utility directors support this recommendation and I respectfully ask for your approval for the, of this purchase from SEDC. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion a second. You know, this, uh, we had a lengthy discussion about this, uh, comments and questions on, on Monday. You know, we, are, we live in a mobile society and this, this brings this portion of our um, city up into current technology and I'm excited about that for um, our customers and especially those that want to use that as their means of, of paying bills and, and accessing their account and knowing what uh, to keep up with so uh, in, yes sir Councilman Henry thank you mayor uh, Brendan just a, a question and maybe observation about the price tag and you mentioned you mentioned the $117,000 startup cost and and uh, Currently, we're paying about $2,500 a month, and, and that's going to go up to about $5,200 a month. And, of course, as the council knows and you know, we're always spending other folks' money. If I'm ask or any of the other councilmen are ask justifying that cost, and if, if this is the answer that I gave, would, would this be correct in your view? Uh, as I see it, it's maybe threefold. One, a lot more convenience, as the mayor pointed out to all our customers, customer convenience. Uh, we believe we're going to get a, um, a more reliable platform. And we believe that we're going to get better access to data. Is that is that the answer that you would give? Is that yes, a good answer? That is correct. That is okay. correct. Anything else that I'm leaving out in case I miss that? No. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Council Woodford. Uh, Brenda, you say all department not the department heads affected by this. You guys have studied this for about two years. Yes. Off and on. And it being convenient, there's no rate increase to the rate payers. At the directors at this time have no no plans to increase the rates directly be as a result of this. So purchase. it's making it e this is making it easier for our rate payers to pay their bills. It's going to be yes. if they choose 24/7 yes. security. 
the data that we have is going to be Great secure, right? <laughs> yes. Of well, I mean, we currently have all that data right now, okay. and it is we've got firewalls and we've got Firewall. security to protect it, so there will be no difference there. Okay. Great. Thank you. I, I just, yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to reiterate some of the things that my council members have already said. Tell you, we ask lots of questions about this, everybody. Mm -hmm. We 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 peppered this with question after question after question. Myself being probably one of the most obnoxious ones out there asking questions with that. But uh, um, one of the, one of the, I just want to uh, uh, clarify this, make sure one of the things that I had a little that I question question Brenda about is that some of these if you pay online and stuff like that with your through your phone app there is a charge to that um, it was like a four dollar charge or something like that currently but, yes yeah but you also mentioned that uh, the, the company is going to uh, try to facilitate or have uh, like not direct deposit but direct direct pay direct payment from your from your bank account that well, we currently have bank draft you can sign up for automatic bank draft yeah, so that and that's free of charge and you can do that today so that's still that still yes. will not change and that could segue still segue in right to the right into this so it was it's not like you're going to get charged you're going to get dinged no. four dollars there'll be a, you'll still have the same ways that you can pay you can come into customer service and pay in person with check or cash we have the drive through that will still maintain the drive through and you can th come through the drive through window pay with check or cash we still have the drop box on the side of the building after hours you can drop a check i don't encourage people to put cash in the drop box but you can drop a check in the cat in the drop box um and then you can sign up for automatic bank draft yep. i mean that's so that's that, all that's those, carefree all those things are still they're still, still there available. Which is, I, wanted to, yes. I just want to clarify for our folks out there yes. that like just don't particularly like change but the other folks that do like change you can yes. you can actually look on look at your bill online you can actually see your usage on a, on a graph right. scale see how how well you're doing as far as like conserving conserving energy conserving water conserving gas etc so that's correct there, it's it's it, it has a it, it's a wonderful application i just I, I love it when usually when government gets involved doing stuff it ends up costing people more money but in this situation the way i understand it is that uh, we're gonna we're gonna offer better services for no extra cost, and uh, and I appreciate our our uh, our department heads and your department for making sure that that was able to that, that was able to go through because usually if you say we're gonna add better services and do more stuff, the customer's gonna see a price increase, and we have not our our department heads and our uh, and our budget department has not allowed that to happen so. You don't get you don't see that very much in government so i appreciate it very well much and there's a possibility to save some money Absolutely. if they sign up for paperless billing we're not paying for that postage to mail a paper bill to somebody and then two if they sign up for the alerts and the reminders um then they don't forget to pay their bill and they don't get hit with a penalty you know so there is a possibility to save some money potential for more cost savings. Yes. well anyway i think uh, we're we we wore this sucker out and i tell you what i'm i'm very happy to vote yes for this yes Okay, thank you. Any other comments? I'll vote. Five yes votes, motion carries. Thank you, 7D. Consider awarding bid for 2018 Waterline Leak Survey Services. Uh, Ronnie Kelly. Mayor and Council, we have <clears throat> taken proposals and open bids on our annual leak detection services and received two bids. Richards LMC was the low bidder, and we would recommend both options uh, give us the option to for the original 115 miles with an additional 150 mile options if we're happy at the end of that 115 miles <clears throat> total price twenty nine thousand one hundred and fifty dollars and would recommend approval thank you is there a motion <coughs> second motion second any discussion all vote five yes both thank you here. thank you 7e consider appeal from miss jane perry relative to the cookville tree board letter of 9517 mr rader uh yes i please the council uh this is a appeal from miss jane perry from a decision of the tree board affirming uh its uh, letter decision which it sent uh which it which it made on september 5th 2017 and sent to Miss Perry indicating that uh, several of her trees uh, were dead and should be removed. Uh, the tree board uh, affirmed that in its meeting uh, by a vote of seven to nothing uh, in accordance with the uh, ordinance. She has a right to appeal that to the city council, which she has done. Here's my understanding. She's represented by who I assume this is her attorney who 
telephoned me and indicated he wanted to ask for a postponement of this appeal. I told him it would be up to the city council whether or not to postpone the appeal or proceed with it tonight. Uh, if you want to ask him to speak to that for his three minutes, you can do that. And then if there's a motion to continue it, to postpone it, we'll postpone it. If there's no motion, we'll proceed with the appeal tonight. Did you want to speak to that matter, sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor and council members, my name is Tom Potter. I live in Allert, Tennessee. I have a small law practice in Jamestown. I was requested by Ms. Perry to speak for her in this matter tonight. I've just received a uh, pretty good group of papers, emails, maps, photographs, including the uh, relevant tree ordinances uh, by a very hospitable Ms. Gail Fowler. Um, there appears to be an some confusion about which trees we're talking about here. Uh, and Mr. Rader says some trees are dead. Gentlemen, I've been out there. I didn't, for a fellow who's cut a lot of firewood, I did not see any dead trees. I did not see any ruts up against the trees that uh, are close to the fence separating Miss Perry's property from her next door neighbor. There are overhanging limbs. Those can be dealt with. Just, I'm not, the question is, you want this put off? Or I'm, I'm explaining why I want it put off because there's, so, there's contradictions. It's unclear. There's a lot of paperwork involved here, and I'd like to have time to, uh, to deal with that. Okay, so is there a motion to defer? Okay, there's no motion to defer, so we will proceed. All right. So... May, uh, I can bring the council up to date on where we are. Uh, a complaint was made to the tree board at the beginning of last fall. Uh, the, tree, the tree board statute provide, or ordinance provides as follows, and I'll quote it. Tree removal, dead tree, disease, dying trees that pose a safety or health risk to residents, utility lines, service lines, or other trees shall be removed in a timely manner. This section will apply to both public and private trees. The tree board will make a risk determination. If the tree is on private property, the city will serve notice of said risk and specify a reasonable time for the removal to be accomplished by the owner. If the tree is on public property, the appropriate governmental department will be contacted with a recommendation of the tree to be removed. Um, upon receipt of the notice to remove the tree, the owner may appeal the decision within 15 days or the next meeting of the tree board. Ms. Perry, uh, the tree board did examine the property and issued a letter dated September 5th, 2017, that said, this notice is issued by the Cookville Tree Board in regard to hazard trees in violation of City of Cookville Tree Ordinance 13-107, section 5A and 5B. The trees in violation having been brought to the attention of the board by the City of Cookville Department in response to a residential concern have been deemed hazardous by two certified arborists serving on the Cookville Tree Board. The said trees have been flagged for identification purposes. As within the bounds of the city tree ordinance, the landowner shall have 15 days to return the property to compliance or appeal to the Cookville Tree Board at the next scheduled meeting date. There was some um, delay in actually getting this to Ms. Perry. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the delay was, but it ultimately, it was actually given to her and she appeared before the tree board with, uh, she had a witness, Mr. Dr. Douglas Earhart and presented her appeal to the tree board. The tree board heard her evidence and heard from the two arborists and voted seven to nothing to affirm the decision uh, that was issued on September 15, 2017. Ms. Perry then uh, filed the appeal to come to the city council so if Ms. Fowler, do you have the sticker, clicker? Uh, this is where the property is located. This is the side of the property for the city councils. It's behind Eastwood Baptist Church on Eastwood Drive, I believe. Uh, this is the side of the property. It's a fairly large tract, but there is, mis there is a home on it. Uh, did you have the photographs taken before? In 2013, uh, according to Google Earth, 
this is what the property looked like. Of course, we had all the storms. Uh, currently today, this is what the, do you have the picture for today? That's not it. Do you have the, you, you don't have one for today? All right. This is the, at this point in time, we'll let uh, the arborist who examined the uh, property, uh, we'll let Mr. Jeff Fitzpatrick speak and he can demonstrate on these photographs what he found and what his findings were. And I can pass these pictures down to, and, you, and the board can, the, the council can look at these. And Mr. Fitzpatrick, the pictures don't show up very well on the projector, but he can, if you could go ahead, Mr. Yes. Mr. Fitzpatrick, first of all, uh, state your name for the city council. My name is Jeff Fitzpatrick. And uh, are you employed by the city of Cookville? <laughs> yes, I am. And what capacity are you employed? I am the utility forester and right-of-way superintendent for the right. Cookville Electric Department. And are you a certified arborist? Yes, I am. All right. And what is a certified arborist? A certified arborist is an arborist who has undergone a series of training in addition to our education and we uh, are trained in modern arboricultural technique and we uh, meet a requirement of 10 continuing education units per year to maintain that status. All right, and did you examine uh, the property of Miss Perry based upon the complaint uh, to determine whether or not there were hazardous trees on her property? Yes, sir. And tell, tell the council what you found. Okay, upon examination of the property, the biggest threat that uh, I saw was a red oak tree uh, that we looked at. And as you can see, uh, uh, or that it says that the roots are lifting and that there is movement in the breeze, uh, indicated by the yellow line near the uh, trunk of the tree. Uh, that day there was a gentle breeze blowing. Uh, you could stand there and the ground was actually lifting up and down somewhat. Uh, as the wind blew, uh, you can see one large structural root uh, just to the uh, right of the photo. Uh, Maybe if we dim the lights a little bit, I wonder if we could do that. You can turn that roll off over there. I beg your pardon? That roll of lights. Okay, turn it off. on the timer. No, it's got to push it back. Okay. I just need to back up one, James. I'm sorry, I didn't even make a touch. Wow, where's the map? Is that? There it goes. Yeah, you done. There we go. Oh, uh, right there. I'm going to see this one. Okay. The uh, uh, outside of that yellow indicated zone. Uh, There's a shows. laser pointer if you want to use it. You want to use this? Oh, yes, sir. I'm not sure it'll work or not. Doesn't look like it's. Yeah, it's working. Working. Yeah. Oh, one broken uh, structural anchoring root is shown in this area and uh, there are actually uh, lots of tracks that are evident from uh, heavy equipment use and the root system actually exists in the top 28 to 30 inches of soil and goes as far as uh, two to three times the drip line that would be the farthest branches of the tree and <laughs> the problem that we run into in this situation and if you would go ahead and advance to the next slide. The problem that we run into in this situation is that uh, the root system uh, coalesces uh, from uh, a microscopic level all the way to larger anchoring uh, roots. And uh, you can see that from the damage from the equipment and other uprooting trees, that there were large holes that were left. And during this time of rain, uh, these holes had been excavated. Uh, the root system has gone through a system 
of or a period of drying out, uh, of being waterlogged again, no doubt uh, it is causing decay to worsen as time passes and uh, the structural integrity of the trees uh, as based on my previous statement of the uh, tree actually lifting the ground up and down at that time uh, is very unsafe. All right. what, how, many, how many trees did you find were hazardous? Oh, if uh, memory serves me correctly, there were seven of the trees that were of significant size. All right, and what does this photograph show? This uh, photograph is uh, from the north looking toward the back of the residence at 1235 Eastwood. Uh, the tree is off center. Uh, no doubt it has grown this way some because of the uh, stand of timber that was there initially. Of course that timber was harvested, salvaged because of damage of the storm which was very severe. Uh, the remaining tree is now then weakened as uh, is often a practice in that we, or uh, something that we observe in forestry after a stand of timber has been cut, uh, the tree actually develop uh, what is called uh, resistance wood and they will lose their strength as the stand is cut down. Uh, also, uh, besides being subject to wind throw because of that, uh, there is construction damage from the logging operation uh, and uh, as also previously stated that the ground is lifting and moving. All right, now what about these trees right here? These are uh, from the back of the house looking further northward, uh, some sweet gum trees, two of which are completely uprooted and lodged into another tree and uh, they pose a risk they could fall completely to the ground as well. Are they just being held up by another tree? Yes. All right, now what does this photograph show right here? This photograph is from the front of the house and uh, it shows in the background the uh, red oak that was mentioned first and you can see the degree of lean that it has and it is leaning toward the garage to the neighboring property to the west and is leaning across the other trees that are in the foreground of the picture are leaning toward the driveway as well. Some of them are. Uh, one of them is actually uh, leaning a little bit toward uh, the driveway there at the residence and I think that there was a car destroyed during the storm by another tree right there that fell. All right. And uh, is this another picture here? Yes, that is at the uh, front of the house, immediately to the west of the driveway. And there is uh, extensive damage all the way up to the root flare of the trees. And the trees are leaning, as stated, to the west toward the neighboring property. All right, now the notice to Miss Perry on September 5th, 2017 says the hazardous trees have been flagged for identification purposes. Uh, did you flag those? Yes. And how were they flagged? The trees were flagged with uh, an indicator nail, that uh, short aluminum nail with a plastic washer around it and a small piece of green and white ribbon on each one for identification purposes. All right. So they were, if you'd looked at the tree, you'd know which ones that, that you yes. had, had determined to be hazardous. Yes. All right. As a as a certified arborist, was there any doubt in your mind that these trees you've identified uh, were hazardous and should be uh, removed? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the trees should be removed. Uh, it's something that it, we consider in uh, an instance like this is not just the health of the tree, it's the target it can hit if the tree falls altogether or fails in part and in this case there's a very high priority target which is a driveway and a garage where that uh, people are going to be moving vehicles in and out and uh, as well as pets uh, so forth. All right. Now in this photograph right here to the left where you see a car and a kind of a gabled roof is that the property owned by Mr. Buford? Yes. And the, pro and the property to the right the house with the with the white that you see, is that the property owned by Miss Perry? Yes. 
does it pose, does it, in your opinion, do these trees pose a danger to both residents located there? The uh, tree in the back, uh, it could possibly pose a uh, threat to both residents. Uh, the one in the, or actually two there in the front, uh, one of them is more toward uh, the west, one of them leans more toward the east. The one in the foreground between it and the red oak that was mentioned, uh, it's actually lead, leaning toward Mr. Buford's property. The uh, other one is leaning toward Miss Perry's property. So the, all the properties at risk there, not just not just Mr. Buford, but Miss Perry's own properties at risk here, in your yes. opinion? Yes, it is, and uh, depending on uh, what type of uh, weather front came through in the direction and wind speed again, uh, either property or both could be affected. All right. All right. Does the council have any questions of Mr. Fitzpatrick? All right. Uh, is Guy Zimmerman here? Can you come up, please? If you come over here, you can use this. You can get Mr. Mills to help you use the clicker. <laughs> All right, tell the council for the record who you are, sir. I'm Guy Zimmerman. And who are you employed by, sir? State of Tennessee. And what's your position with I'm State of Tennessee? Area Forester. I work I beg your pardon? <clears throat> I'm an area forester and I work for the Tennessee Division of Forestry. Okay, you've been a forester here in town for about as long as I can remember, haven't you? I have. A, I started here in 84. All right. And uh, are you board certified arborist? I am. All right. And did you, uh, you're on the tree board, aren't you? I am on the tree board as advisor. All right. And did you go uh, to this property and make an examination of these trees? I did. Mr. Zimmerman, you can bring your microphone up a little bit if you, so okay. you don't have to be in. There you go. All right. Each time. And can you tell the council what you found when you examined the trees on the Perry property? Essentially, I found the same thing that Jeff has already gone over. All right. Is there anything, uh, do you agree with everything he says? I agree with everything he says. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, just that these, a, a hazard tree is a tree that has a target. And if there's no target, it's not really doesn't pose as a hazard and and all these trees do have targets right. is the property of miss perry as well as mr buford at risk by these trees both properties are at risk all right is there any doubt in your mind that these trees pose a hazard and should be removed none at all all right does the council want to ask uh, any questions of mr zimmerman councilman henry is there a, when you say target, you're you're referencing the properties. Is that what you're the, the, the yes, the property, the properties, the, the property. Uh huh. All right. Thank the you. property that houses the the uh, the storage people, Phys automobiles, physical structures, as opposed to just land. Though, right. Right. We're right. About a physical structure. It could physical fall. structures or, that have costs associated or life associated okay. with okay. it. All right. Now, if this was out in the middle of a forest with no houses or cars or people around you wouldn't view it as hazardous i would not the reason you consider it hazardous unless i was standing under it yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> all right i agree okay all right does any other member of the council have any questions thank you mr zimmerman all right that's the uh, evidence from the tree board and the arborist oh well, i tell you we have jamie newen jamie are you here yeah. can you come up please I didn't mean to leave you out. Help, help me pronounce your name, make sure I do it right. Noonan. Noonan, all right. All right, and what's your position? I'm the city urban forester. And what is an urban forester? Uh, urban forester is just my job is to manage trees within the city as a stand or as a single tree and pretty much anything. <laughs> all right, and are you familiar with trees to be able to determine whether or not they're hazardous or not? Yes, sir. And did you actually look at these trees on Miss Perry's property? Yes, sir. I went out there first when Mr. Buford called, and then I called Jeff Fitzpatrick and Guy Zimmerman for um, just more opinion. All right. And what was your opinion? My opinion was the same as theirs, that they are posing a hazard. To both homes? To both homes, with the targets, like Guy said. All right. 
is there any doubt in your mind that these trees are, are hazardous and in danger of uh, falling on either one of these homes? No. All right, you work for the city now as an employee, don't you? Yes, sir. All right. Does the council have any questions of Ms. Noonan? All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, at this time, we'll give Mr. Ms. Perry the opportunity to present whatever evidence she would like to present. That's the that's the uh, evidence on behalf of the the city and the tree board. If I may speak for Ms. Perry. Sir, yeah, you have an opportunity, um, or she can speak for herself. Well, certainly be glad to give up the uh, podium for Ms. Perry if she wishes to address the council. Um, I do have some questions for Mr. Fitzpatrick. Can you turn the lights back up, please? Do you have any witnesses? No, sir. What about Dr. Earhart, who examined the property on behalf of Ms. Perry? We were not able to contact Dr. Earhart. Well, you have that, any that's one of the reasons for requests from us some additional time. Well, there is, I may say, a difference of opinion regarding these trees. Well, if you have an opinion or if you have any evidence, this is your opportunity to present it to the city council. Well, I would, as I say, I would like to ask Mr. Fitzpatrick some questions. I'd be up to the mayor. Well, I mean, we don't want to get into a long. Not, it's just going to be a, this is not a trial. A debate. You can this have is, a. I would it's say just you, evidence, and you can have a few questions, but not. We're not going to. Oh, I don't intend to keep anyone here overnight. Well, we don't intend. We, to we stay don't overnight. either. Uh, let's do uh, three questions. How about that, Jeff? Yes, sir. Um, and you're in the tree ordinance uh, hearing, City of Cookville, 13 107, section 5A and 5B. 5A talks about dead, diseased, or dying trees. Are any of these trees dead, diseased, or dying? The fact that the trees are broken. You might want to lady. speak into the speak into that. So, Apology. yeah, no worries. The fact that the trees are damaged in the root system uh, even down to a microscopic level yes they are diseased could you tell us specifically what disease yes I can it is called uh, uh, I have actually heard the term called caterpillar wilt and it uh, that uh, refers to caterpillar equipment driving back and forth over root systems that uh, compacts the roots at a microscopic and macroscopic level. Uh, there's actually an interface between the root system and uh, a uh, fungi. It is a uh, symbiotic relationship where the, the tree roots go down to a microscopic level and at that point they interface with the mycorrhizal fungi and uh, they supply nutrients to the tree. After the soil compaction and the lack of aeration, the tree becomes unable to feed itself. And after that, it becomes unable to fend off diseases. And that's why that I stated that uh, as the ground was exposed and the roots were exposed, that there was time for drying of the roots, which kills them, and then there was moisture that uh, compounds these factors and actually makes it worse. The photograph, this will do here on the, on the screen. Uh, would you agree that this is the side of Miss Perry's house that faces her next door neighbor? Yes. With a fence? Yes. Wooden fence? That is the west side of the property. And back? If you touch the screen, it may be. Oh, don't touch it. Oh, don't touch the screen. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. 
This this tree here is the one I believe you were saying the red oak with the compacted roots. Yes. Are any of the trees between the house? This is my question. Are any of the trees between the house and the fence? Have they suffered uh, caterpillar compaction? Yes. Caterpillar. Yes, sir. There is some evidence that uh, not all of the equipment went through there, but some of the equipment did. And actually the resulting trees, or the result of some of the other trees that stood beside it that fell, had uh, enormous root systems that left ruts in the yard uh, from memory. We're not talking about the yard, <coughs> just, just right here. This, this narrow space between these trees next to the fence. Yes, sir, there is. Side the of the house. There was heavy equipment through there, you're saying? Yes. And what kind of tracks did they leave? Well, uh, you're at six questions, and I yes, said sir. three. So. And, and given the limitations, uh, like I say, I'm not here to keep you gentlemen all night. I've, I've exhausted my uh, questions, and I'll withdraw. If Ms. Perry would like to address the council. Yeah, we would like to have Ms. Perry. We'd like to hear from Ms. Perry. She's the property owner. Yes, sir. good faith tonight with Mr. Potter as my representative and I was only able to get him this week. I have been sick. They gave me from February the 7th until now and I was sick two weeks there to get counsel and you all have turned me down on a very simple thing that I ask for more time. I am very, very upset. Mm. All that we were asking for was more time. That was all. Do you have anything you want to say about your trees, Miss Perry? We'll, we'll address that. Beg your pardon? Is that yes or no? Uh -uh, that's all. All right. I think we should hear from Mr. Buford. He has been here a number of times on this issue, and we want to give everybody the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry I have to be here again. I want to appreciate the arborists that came out to my house in this. Um, I'm going to ask the council to vote tonight. I've been here three times. They've been to Miss Perry's house. I have made every attempt to resolve this at the lowest level possible. Uh, I have an attorney, uh, even the attorney that she had from Nashville pleaded with her to settle this and she didn't and now she has another attorney here tonight um, please please I've waited a long time this is affecting my life and the safety of my property for me personally for my structures for my chocolate lab and my vehicles I see this every day I deal with this every day I would like to have this resolved and uh, I've been trying to make this happen since May of last year. I, I asked you to take a vote tonight, please. Right. Let me, uh, out of a fairness to uh, Ms. Perry, uh, we do have the letter from Douglas Earhart that he submitted at the tree board meeting, and I'll read that to the council. Uh, this is from Douglas Earhart, uh, who is, he's an advisor to the tree board as well as uh, Mr. Zimmerman. Thank you for calling me to evaluate the condition of the trees at your mother's location on Eastwood Drive. I visited the site and met your mother on the afternoon of blank October, question mark, question mark, October. The front yard was in terrible shape due to the straight line windstorm that occurred previously. Two trees near the house had obviously been dislodged at their roots, one on the fence side of the driveway with a yellow danger flagging tape encircling the hole and one at the entry walk from the driveway. It is amazing that the house suffered no damage by these trees being blown down. The front yard appeared bulldozed to the periphery trees to clear the debris. The rear yard had a few trees remaining, apparently those in question for your inquiry, and the area under these trees had not been cleared of debris. But the remainder of the rear yard, except for the area surrounding the storage building, had been completely bulldozed to remove the broken and felled trees and limbs to the rear property lines. Your mother indicated that the western property line abutted, the, abutted and followed the adjoining property fence 
and from its end, the property line continued straight line to the rear corner. That imaginary line was the western boundary for bulldozing clearance of the rear property. I performed a level one tree risk assessment on the trees that I found marked with the white green spots flagging tape. I was not informed about who fastened the flagging to the trees. This evaluation consisted of using ground level visual inspection of the trunks and canopies and dead blow hammer sounding of the trunks. In addition to the flagging trees, there were a few other trees in proximity that were not flagged, three or four of them from the mailbox back to the first flag tree, and a few other small or otherwise non-flag larger trees adjacent to the residence on or near the area behind the house. Tree number one, 20.5 inch diameter red oak, trunk leans toward the drive and road, has, rel has a relatively small and high canopy with some broken branches in the canopy. Immediately adjacent between the driveway is a stump, another stump and a small tree. Tree two, 14.0 inch diameter white oak, ivy on trunk. It has a thin and one-sided canopy toward the fence, hole with a yellow danger flagging. Tree three, 16.7 inch diameter sweet gum, ivy on trunk. It has a thin and one-sided canopy toward the fence, gumballs present unflagged tree, 13.2 inch diameter, unsure of species near the residence and hole. It has a moderate canopy yet thin. Tree number four, 21 inch post oak, trunk leads toward the house and fence. Dead branches are present in the lower canopy. Canopy is thin and one sided toward the house and fence. Unflagged tree, 14.5 inch diameter beech, relatively thin canopy entwined with adjacent tree. Tree number five, 32.4 inch diameter red oak. Trunk is vertical, but canopy is one-sided to the west. Apparently more trees were previously present to the east and north that completed four canopy space. This canopy has only two major scaffolds. The canopy has numerous dead wood hangers and multiple branches that are broken off, apparently by storm damage. It is unclear whether they are from the most recent storm unflagged 8.5 inch diameter hickory, straight trunk, thin canopy, and multiple small deadwood hangers from adjacent trees. The sounding test, striking with dead blow hammer to identify resonating cavities, did not indicate that any of the, these trees had cavities that might indicate possible risk of failure of the trunk. During the inspection with your mother, the neighbor, Mr. Buford, asked if we would speak to him and we did. He showed us the damages to his rear fence and the existing broken and leaning trees that are behind the fence and he felt are threatening the fence. He became irritated during our discussion because he believed the property behind his fence belonged to your mother, S said the property tax maps have her name on them. She would not admit to that and stated she thought she did not own that property. Otherwise, she would have that damage to praise and arrange for storm restoration and clearing there as well as for her rear yard. After further discussion, she agreed that there was damage present or potential to his fence from the trees in that area and stated that if she did own the property, she would of course allow Mr. Buford onto the property to clear any and all trees he thought were potentially or actually damaging his fence. She adamantly restated she did not know whether she actually owned that property behind the fence. I took photographs of the area and the fence line and they are included in this letter report by reference, but they are prepared uh, and presented separately, and I do not have copies of those. I will say at the tree board meeting, Ms. Perry did say that she had spoken with Mr. Buford and agreed that she did own that property behind that she was questioning at this level. And if she wants to dispute that, she can, but that was what she said at the tree board meeting. I don't want to dispute. You'll, you'll, have, you'll need to come up here if you're going to. And, and just to be clear, this I'm is, uh, hold on just a minute, ma'am. Uh, just to be clear, this is not a court case, okay? This is a hearing of an appeal of a tree board decision, pure and simple. It's, so it's not a court case, so we're not going to, you know, do act like it's a court case. So go ahead. But that seems to be what's going on. And again, huh? I came here in good faith to ask for more time. That's all I needed. That's all I was asking for. And I, and I have been... I don't understand. I'm, I'm a taxpaying citizen and I don't understand why I am being treated this way. 
And as far as there's more, so, so many different aspects of this that it cannot be handled by just a question or two. As far as that property behind me, there was, there was, there's incidents about that, which cannot be addressed right now in two or three minutes. There's a whole other scenario, but I am not being given the opportunity as a citizen to get the, what I need is some time. And that was what I had asked for in the tree board. I was treated like dirt and I do not appreciate it. I went there in good faith, thinking I was gonna speak with the, the tree board. I didn't know I needed to take a lawyer. I mean, it, this is ridiculous, it really is. So what is, no. so what's the, what is the question right now? The, uh, the decision for the council is whether to affirm the decision of the tree board or reverse the decision of the tree board okay. or if you wanted to give miss perry more time that she's asked for repeatedly tonight you can do that although i would point out this has been going on since last september and i would like to point out we have tried since last september to get information as to how this the trees were assessed my daughter has tried and tried and tried, and we have not, not been given anything. Miss Perry, you had Dr. Earhart examine this, who's an expert on your behalf, and I read his report to the city council. You had the opportunity, you were at the tree board, and you gave, you had every opportunity to speak, and you were not treated like dirt. Uh, you were treated very respectfully, and you're here tonight, uh, and you were given this notice a long time ago to, that this was the appeal, and that's what's heard tonight. If you have any other evidence you want to present, you ought to present it. Otherwise, it's up to the city council to make a decision. We have another uh, certified arborist that has done an examination of the trees too. There's too many things. That's why we ask for time. Hmm. That's why we ask. That's all we came here tonight, respectfully asking for time. Because this was pushed on me from March the 1st from that fe February the 7th meeting. In two weeks of that, I had, I would, had a virus. I came to the city hall so sick, I had to get out and come there. All we were asking for tonight was time. Is there a motion on the floor to the decision of the tree board was um, that these were hazardous, is that correct? The decision of the tree board was that uh, The trees uh, in violation have been brought to the attention of the board by the city of Cookville in response to a residential concern have been deemed hazardous by two certified arborists serving the Cookville tree board. The trees have been flagged for identification purposes as within the bounds of the city tree ordinance, the landowner shall have 15 days to return the property to compliance or appeal to the, uh, or appeal to the tree board, which affirm this decision. So the, the question is you affirm the decision of the tree board which found these trees to be hazardous and they should be removed within 15 days. So is there a motion to affirm the decision of the tree board? So moved. Is there, is there a motion and a second? Any discussion among the council? Yes, sir. Councilman Henry. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> full transparency, uh, I came, as I entered City Hall tonight, I, I saw Ms. Perry and, and the attorney had a very pleasant conversation with them. And it, uh, it turns out that uh, Ms. Perry and I were in in some meetings together a number of years ago with a Christian organization and known at a, uh, at a distance since that time. And, you know, everything I know, Ms. Ferry, about her is that she's a good person with a good heart, uh, and, and that's what I perceive her to be. Uh, but, but having said that, Ms. Perry, honestly, you know, I don't know, and hear my heart on this, I don't know what would be different two weeks from now or a month from now especially in light of the fact as long as it's going on, I don't know what would be different. I don't know. I, I don't see how anything would change. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is, this is, our, the, biz, this is uh, the council side of the portion now, please. And uh, we just got a situation, and it's not reflecting on you as a person, but we just got a situation that's got to be dealt with. It's just got to be dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Any Mayor. other comments from the council? All vote. 
Five yes votes, motion carries. Okay, that uh, can, can uh, finishes up our agenda portion of the meeting. We have time at the end for citizens that would like to speak on non-agenda items. Is there anyone that would like to address the council on non-agenda items? Okay, any comments from the council? All right, we are adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, my name is Mike Wood. I am chairman of the Couple Tree Board, and I'm here for a couple purposes. The first one is to thank the mayor and the city council for your continued support of the tree board. Uh, I guess this kind of a first, at least under my um, uh, tenure, is uh, I've got a bulletin that I'd like to hand out, and this is the accomplishments that we have done in 2017 and 18. I'd just like to give it to you to look over. And again, we just want to thank you for your continued support. And, and going back, two of the council members here were instrumental in, in the establishment of the Cookville Tree Board, and, and uh, thankful for uh, Councilman Woodford, his wife, Julia, has been, been a tremendous asset to the Philbert Tree Board, serving for several years and just as recently stepped off. So, again, from the Philbert Tree Board, we just want to um, uh, thank you for, uh, for your support and that, uh, be aware that we know we serve strictly at your discretion. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the audience? Any comments from the council? All right. We're adjourned. <laughs>